wanted to offer up some of the biggest questions in the Big 12 and the ACC going into 2021. Let me start at Texas. I intentionally didn't touch on the horns earlier in the show because I wanted to touch on this right now. There's an interesting little development at Texas. Granted, as is the case with everyone we talk about tonight, it's still very early in camp. But if you, again, are a big believer in preview magazine culture, I would imagine a lot of those preview mags had listed as the starter at quarterback for Texas this year the name Casey Thompson. And Casey Thompson may very well be the starting quarterback for Texas, but my first biggest question here in the Big 12 is, does Steve Sarkeesian know who his quarterback's going to be? Because if he doesn't know who it's going to be, obviously the author and editor of a magazine can't know, nor can I know, nor you know. Now, we can guess, but I don't think Sark knows yet. And if some truth serum were injected into him, based on what we're hearing from the first few practices in Austin, he may be leaning slightly a direction other than Casey Thompson, which would mean Hudson Card. Now, think about Steve Sarkeesian, and they've got a scrimmage this coming Saturday that's going to go a long way in deciding this. But think about Steve Sarkeesian and what you saw from him at Alabama last couple of years. What was paramount at the quarterback position? What took Mac Jones from a guy who couldn't get on the field and not much was expected of, and a guy that Bryce Young was going to come in and overtake? What took Mac Jones from that to being a first-round NFL draft pick. Timing, accuracy, a good enough arm, but being able to throw receivers open, or in other words, great touch. That's what took Mac Jones to eventually the level that he got taken to in Steve Sarkeesian's offense. Why do I mention all of these intangibles? Well, it's because that's what they keep saying about Hudson Card out of Texas. He's the guy who throws the better ball. He's the guy who's got a little bit more accuracy. And I'm just telling you, if they were saying it about Casey Thompson, it would be affirmation for a lot of people's already held idea of what the Texas quarterback position is going to be. And so they'd say, yep, I knew it. But since it's being said about Hudson Card, people are saying, oh, it's still early in camp. Oh, it is. It is. And Casey Thompson may very well take this job by the throat when the pads go on and it's time to scrimmage. But I'm just telling you, don't discount when they say that kind of stuff about Hudson Card. Don't discount it. You don't know anything about Steve Sarkeesian. You don't know anything about what he really feels about his roster out there. That staff hadn't been there half a dozen years. You don't have multiple case studies on this, in other words. So you could get a little surprise thrown your way uh, by the time that Louisiana game rolls around. Now let's go to a team that is widely expected to contend for a national championship this year, and that is the Clemson Tigers. You think back, what year was it, Colin? It was 2018, the, the 2018 season at least, when they beat Alabama out in Santa Clara. Not my favorite host city in the world, but they did give me a sweet book bag that I still use every day, even to this day. So thank you guys for that. What stands out the most about that game when Clemson just mopped the floor with Bama, splattered them? Only time we've ever said that about Bama. But Bama got splattered. There was just tied all over the place out there. What stands out to me is Clemson receivers, it felt like 50 times that night, made catches on balls that weren't 50-50 balls. They were far more difficult to catch than that. I would call them like 20-80 balls or 30-70 balls. And you just see a hand. You see a hand. And it, boom, it's Justin Ross. That was his coming out party. And that's what stood out. Well, how do you make those catches? You have supreme athleticism, but you've got length. That's what you have. Next question in the ACC is, is the Clemson wide receiver room back to being an elite unit? Because when you think back to that 2018 Bama beatdown, you think about length and you think about incredible circus catches at receiver. With that in mind and the announcement of Justin Ross being cleared by Dabo Swinney, I want to read you some stats here right quick. They're simple. It's just some height and weight. Justin Ross, 6'4", 205. E.J. Williams, 6'3", 190. Joseph Nada, 6'3", 220. Frank Ladson, 6'3", 205. So everyone can dunk without barely having to jump at the receiver core this year for Clemson. And what that means is, at least from an athletic standpoint, they finally look again for the first time in a couple of years like they did in 2018. What does this mean ultimately? Well, when you got the kind of quarterback that they'll have at Clemson, then it probably means a lot. So it probably first means that they're going to crucify the rest of the ACC. But then it also probably means when they get into one of these playoff-type situations against an Alabama or against a Georgia or an Oklahoma, Ohio State, whoever it is, USC. Let's just throw a random school in there. Why don't, why don't we? It means that they are not smothered and they are not out-athleted on the perimeter. 
And in some cases, that's what you ended up seeing. Not very much, but you saw it, for instance, against Ohio State. Don't think you're going to see that this year. So Clemson, because of that, among other reasons, has a great shot to win it all this year. Now I want to go right back to where we were just at a couple of minutes ago with Miami, but a totally different angle here. There has been a lot written about the Eric King. There's been a lot written about Miami and expectations. But I want to ask you very specifically, are you ready to live in a world where offensive line is a strength for the Miami Hurricanes? Because I can't remember in several years doing this show now, the last time that we entered a season and I could honestly look at you and say, you know what I like about Miami? Offensive line. Offensive line looks good. Well, it does this year. 138 combined starts returning is close to an all-time college football record. Now, the kickback could be, well, okay, are they good? Well, I don't think they're wall-to-wall first-rounders. They may not even be wall-to-wall first-team all-ACCers. They have some candidates that fit that description. But what they have is continuity. What you have is a unit, at least, that you think you can count on. So think about the chain of events here. Everyone wants to know what Derek King can do. Everyone wants to know what Cameron Harris and company could do at running back. All these receivers, they feel like they're as deep as they've obviously been under Manny Diaz at receiver. All of these pieces, Will Mallory at tight end, looks to do some big things this year as Brevin Jordan departs. But all that's contingent on quarterback play. This is the same kind of thing we've said about Florida several times over the last few years, and it's the same kind of theme with Miami. And for that matter, we said it about Florida State. It's it's like an epidemic up and down the state of Florida at the Power 5 level, well, Miami doesn't have to worry about the other two. But as for their own house, it looks like they've got offensive line figured out. So again, I don't want to fire off uh, bottle rockets of expectation from Miami on the show tonight, even though it kind of sounds like I have. This is something to monitor very closely because, see, a lot of you bet futures, and a lot of you want to bet those week one games, and a lot of you want to bet prop bets for who's going to win a conference. I'm telling you right now, that a lot of the ACC numbers have been built with the idea of skepticism towards the health of De'Eric King and skepticism somewhat overall because of that about the quality of team Miami can have. Well, one of the, I don't know if you guys have heard this, but one of the great added benefits of having a together offensive line, a fully gelled, a cohesive offensive line, is it helps keep that quarterback upright a whole lot more often during the season. And if you're coming off a knee surgery, it greatly reduces risk there. So just something to keep in mind. And lastly, I want to go to my old stomping grounds, even though I've never been to the state. Ames, Iowa is the place. Iowa State is the team. You're looking around at top 10 polls out there. The JP poll will be coming out later this month. You heard me right. How much better can Iowa State get? Everyone's got them listed in the top 10, as they should. We're going to have them helpfully rated inside the top 10 in the JP poll. What's the max potential for them this year? Because to reference Preview Magazine culture for a third time tonight, they check all the Preview Magazine culture boxes. They got returning starters. How many? They got 20 returning starters. Their entire offense returns. And they've got a returning head coach and an offensive coordinator and a defensive coordinator and a quarterback. They got all those boxes checked. So Preview Magazine culture would tell you they could probably go win the NFC North. Because returning starters is all it takes to win in college football, apparently. Well, we all know that's not true. It's one of the more overrated stats. But it does mean something. Having said that, how much does it mean here this year? Because Iowa State, as has been very well chronicled by this point, this is not a roster loaded up with four- and five-star talent. And so the fear, if you had it, would be, well, they're so good at developing guys, and they have guys without that truly elite top-five NFL draft pick type ceiling of potential on them that maybe they just are who they are. So maybe this team returns everything from last year, but what if that team already was the maximum potential of what it could be? I'm going to counter that, and I'm going to tell you, I think you're remembering Iowa State in 2020 being a little bit better than they actually were. What do you remember Iowa State being? Because I don't think a lot of you remember them being 9-3. and I don't think a lot of you remember them losing to Oklahoma State or losing to Louisiana to start the season. People don't remember that. They remember a very competitive game against Oklahoma where they were, I think, minus 2 or 3 in the turnover battle, and they lost a one-possession Big 12 championship game after beating OU in the regular season. You do remember that. And then they played Oregon, and they beat Oregon pretty soundly in the Fiesta Bowl, and so they surely finished on fire. But I think a lot of folks remember them as being a lot closer to their maximum potential last year than they actually were. And so this year, I do think there's room for improvement. What I would love to see 
And I think that last year takes care of it. As I would love to see them start fast, I think there'll be a premium placed on that because of the week one debacle against Louisiana last year. But I would love to see them play at a high level all year. And I would love to see them in a heads-up matchup against Oklahoma where turnovers weren't a factor. It was just an even turnover game. And just watch those teams play. Because I'm a believer last year, they may end up beating Oklahoma if that stat is even. Now, that doesn't mean anything because Oklahoma's a different team this year. And even though you've got a lot of the same pieces, for all we know, Iowa State could be a different team this year. Those, the returning starters doesn't always equal same team. We've seen that many times in college football. So the kicker, I think, with the whole Iowa State concept of them hitting their ceiling already is I don't think they hit their ceiling last year. And so if they hit it this year, I still think there's room for improvement. Maybe not incremental, like 20, 25 percent. Well, I guess that wouldn't be incremental. That would be quantum improvement. But I think there's room for improvement. So those are some of the biggest questions in the ACC and the Big 12 that we have.